Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you all for a great lunch. Um, I am Leticia Acosta, director of the Subiano Academy, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's luncheon. Our rising leaders are most fortunate to have two of the state's great leaders speaking to them in a moment. State Representative Trey Martinez Fisher and University of Texas President Bill Powers. Thank you both for taking the time to be with us today. Before we hear from these two speakers, I would like to extend our warmest thanks to Target, whose commitment to education has recognized Subiendo as a continued partner for three years in a row. Subiendo would be unable to provide the level of programming to our students, parents, and alumni of our program without your generous support. We are proud to have a friend in Target, and I'd like to thank Jessa Brooks, Ben Sanders, and Martin Gentry for joining us today from Target. Thank you. We are also joined by two of Subiendo's Advisory Council members, Mr. Wolfgang Niedert and Mr. Jim Henson. Thank you both for your time and commitment to Subiendo. We appreciate it very much. For those who do not know, Subiendo means climbing or going up. The name refers to the next generation of rising leaders who will address the challenges of our state and nation. Our keynote speaker is already tackling these challenges, which is why we are going to um, start the program now with this. And we certainly appreciate his time. I know they've been in special session for what seems like forever, I'm sure. And we appreciate him being with us today. To introduce, though, um, President Bill Powers, we have Adriel Morgan from El Paso. She will come up here, if you don't mind, and introduce Bill Powers. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Acosta. Good afternoon. Today I have the great pleasure of introducing to you Mr. Bill Powers. A native of Los Angeles, Mr. Powers received his bachelor's degree in chemistry from UC Berkeley in 1967. After serving in the Navy, he attended Harvard Law School and was the managing editor of the Harvard Law Review. He graduated magna cum laude in 1973. Mr. Powers taught at the University of Washington Law School before joining UT's faculty in 1977. He's worked as a legal consultant with the U.S. Congress and Texas and Brazilian legislature. In 2006, Mr. Powers took office as president at the University of Texas at Austin. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome President Bill Powers. Well, thank you all. Thank you, Adriel. Uh, what a pleasure. <clears throat> to be here and look out over this uh, group. I come to uh, Subiendo uh, every year, either at the dinner or the lunch, and uh, it, I must say it gives me great <clears throat> hope and faith and confidence in the future of our state and of our country uh, to see the future leaders of our state uh, at this stage of your careers already taking on uh, leadership roles. So uh, it really is a pleasure uh, to be here. Uh, I too want to uh, thank some people, um, certainly all of the team leaders and the volunteers, all the people in the <clears throat> uh, blue shirts <clears throat> who uh, are helping uh, with this program and are your sort of older sisters and brothers for th those of you who are in the program. Uh, let me say I'm so proud of you. Uh, for your participation in that program, and it's just a cross-section of what our student body here is like, giving back and uh, helping the next generation, not too far behind uh, where you are in your lives now, but helping the next uh, group of students come through and take on leadership roles uh, as well. Let me also thank the, uh, all of the members of the advisory uh, council for their participation in this and Wolfgang and Jim through you to them uh, and, and just a word to the uh, students who are here, both our students and the Subiendo uh, students. <coughs> um, we are blessed here at the university with people who give back in so many ways. 
Um, but you should realize uh, it's not just the university, it's not just the Subiendo staff uh, as wonderful of, uh, of a job as they do, but people in our community, people who have other things to do, uh, Jim and our faculty, Wolfgang and uh, the private equity uh, area, but who care deeply, not just about this university, but care deeply about the next generation of leaders and what this state uh, and nation are going to be like. So thank you for your uh, participation uh, in this. Let me thank two people who are not here, but <clears throat> um, who you will meet tomorrow night. Uh, I'm gonna be out of the country. I won't be able to join you tomorrow night, uh, but I hope you will uh, take uh, special time uh, to get to know them. Uh, you'll meet them at the dinner out at Dimensional uh, Fun tomorrow night. And that's uh, Kenny Jastro and David Booth. Uh, very prominent business leaders in this community. And you should know that Subiendo started uh, several years ago when Kenny Jastro came to my office and he said, you know, <clears throat> uh, those of us, Kenny's the same age as I am, uh, what are we doing to uh, nurture the future of this state uh, and, and the future leaders of this state, especially the future Latino and Latina leaders uh, of this state, but all the leaders uh, of this state, um, and it was uh, his inspiration. It was his and David Booth's very generous funding to get this going. And now to see uh, this program have gotten, having get, gotten traction, students who are here at the university, but at universities all across the country who are uh, graduates of Subiendo is a very, very gratifying uh, thing. So I hope you all will uh, make some special time tomorrow night to thank uh, Kenny Jastro and uh, David Booth. Uh, this is a critical program, uh, and I hope you all are enjoying it. I had the pleasure of talking with many of you as we were waiting for lunch, and you, uh, I think it is doing exactly what the program was designed to do. It's gotten you engaged, you're having a, a good time, but you're also uh, learning quite a bit. But it is a program <clears throat> that uh, is looking at the future gen uh, leaders of this state, your communities, and of our country. And you're focusing on those kinds of issues that are going to be important. Uh, what are we going to do in public education? You all are tackling that. What are we going to do to harness clean energy? You're tackling that. What are we going to do to be smarter in the future about the critical need for water in our state? You're tackling that. Uh, we have diseases like cancer and Alzheimer's and so many more uh, for which we have to find cures and be able to manage, and you're tackling that. What are we going to do to heal our civil culture and our political culture? And you're tackling that. This is your time. This is your future. Uh, and people in my generation and the generations between <coughs> yours and mine uh, are counting on you to make this a better state and a better country. That's what leaders do, and that's what you'll do as you go forward. Um, you know, leadership <coughs> is uh, something you're not born with. You're certainly born with certain talents, intelligence, uh, hard work. You get tremendous nurturing and uh, being pointed in the right direction by your families and your uh, friends, <coughs> uh, by your schools. And you've all received that, and you've all stepped into leadership roles in your communities and in your campuses. Uh, but there's something else about leadership <coughs> that you've also started to do, but that is critical. You've got to choose to be leaders, and that takes courage. It takes courage to say, when there's a problem, I'll step up and be a leader in this. I'll get this organized. Uh, because you're visible, you're taking on a certain uh, sense of confidence about the future, there's always a bit of anxiety, can I really 
get it done. But that is the critical thing, is choosing and having the courage to be a leader. We had a football player on our campus, a wonderful young man, Quan Cosby, who used to return punts. And I used to watch him, <clears throat> and he'd be there looking up, maybe 50 feet in the air, the ball would be up there, people charging down to tackle him, 100,000 people in the stands, millions of people across the country watching. What gave him the courage to stand out and say, I'm going to do that? Well, it was just a choice that he was going to step forward and be in the spotlight and take on that role. That's what leadership is about. It's always a little scary to step out and say, I'm going to be the leader here. Uh, but that's also what Subiendo is all about to support your courage and your dedication to say, yes, uh, it takes some courage, but I'm going to step out there and be a leader and make this a better state and a better country. So I do congratulate you for spending this uh, several days on our campus in the Subiendo. I hope you'll get to see a lot of our campus while you're here, from the museums to the art to the music. Uh, just to the physical campus, including uh, this beautiful ballroom that we're in uh, here. I know that many of you are, well, all of you are rising seniors and going to be thinking about college. I hope you'll think about us with a warm heart. Uh, but wherever you're thinking, and you'll go off all over the country, and that's what Subiendo is about. But uh, get to know us while you're on our campus as well. And now you have the uh, privilege and the uh, pleasure of hearing uh, from a uh, great leader himself who had that courage to run for office, to be a leader in San Antonio. And then when he got to the legislature to stand out and be a leader in the legislature as well, uh, our keynote speaker, the Honorable Trey Martinez Fisher. He's currently serving his seventh term, that's 14 years, representing District 116, that's a portion of San Antonio in the Texas House of Representatives. Both the Houston Chronicle and the San Francisco Chronicle have named him one of the 20 Latino political rising stars of 2012. <clears throat> New York Times called him a heavy hitter whose, quote, loyalty to San Antonio remains steadfast. I say his loyalty to the people of Texas also remains steadfast. Representative Martinez Fisher is chairman of the Mexican-American Legislative Caucus, a leadership role. Uh, it's the oldest and largest Latino legislative caucus in the United States. He's led the caucus in two victorious court battles. He'll be remembered in Texas civil rights history for his work in redistricting and voter photo identification litigation. Sorry. Texas Monthly named him one of the 10 best legislators in 2013. And he's also been recognized as a friend of education and a legislative star by the Texas Classroom Teachers Association. <clears throat> and this year, he played a pivotal role in restoring education funding to Texas schools and was a major player in the state budget negotiations that resulted in a $3.9 billion increase to, to funding of our schools. I'm proud to say he was also a student here at our law school, and I knew him back then, and you knew me back then. Uh, that was two years ago? Yes, uh, <clears throat> two and a half years ago. Um, let me say um, he is a great friend of education, of higher education, and our university. A great, great Friend, and I want to thank you for that, Trey. Um, and I'm proud to say, uh, maybe even more so, he's a personal friend, and I cherish that friendship. So I hope you'll all welcome the Honorable Trey Martinez Fisher.
I don't, I don't know about that. That's a quite an introduction, and uh, President Powers is right. We've known each other a long time. I was a student in his products liability class in my third year of law school at University of Texas in 1998, and I'm here to tell you that grades are important. They're not everything. I think I'm living proof that if I can be a mid-level student in President Powers' class, I can still go on and do cool things. And so I want to thank you for being here, but obviously we are going to strive for excellence, and I believe it's the reason why you're here, because that's the path you've chosen. And I think it's important for you to recognize sort of the central theme of what you heard today from President Powers, as well as what you've been challenging yourself to do as you've been tackling issues that are very difficult to tackle. I think it is about stepping up. I think that is, mo that is most of it. And I will tell you this as somebody, and, and I know that, that uh, depending on how you grew up, that, that you may take this one way or the other, but growing up in my home, you know, I'm three quarters Mexican American, one quarter German Jew, and I get up in the morning and that German Jew takes over and it tells me, today I'm gonna take over the world. And I get up and I read my newspaper, the Express News, I read my New York Times Digest, I drink about three, four cups of coffee, check my Facebook, and then that three-quarter Mexican kicks in and I say, eh, mañana. <laughs> and that's kind of our issue sometimes, is that we put things off until mañana, and mañana then becomes the busiest day of the week, and we never get to it. And if you look at our public policy positions in the state of Texas, you look at the path that we are charting, you can easily see that we are doing things a la mañana. I was you know, looking at this crowd as I walked in and sort of scanning the room uh, in the few minutes I was here, and I said to myself that if the Supreme Court of the United States looked like this, we wouldn't be arguing over Fisher and higher education policy. If the Congress of the United States looked like this room, we wouldn't be arguing over reauthorization of Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act and whether we needed to have updated formulas uh, to deal with racial voter discrimination that's still alive and well in Texas. And you don't have to believe me, you don't have to take my word for it. You just have to look at page two of today's majority opinion, the United States Supreme Court with Chief Justice Roberts and the conservative wing of the Supreme Court said voter discrimination still exists, nobody doubts that. But in invalidating section four of the Voting Rights Act, They've taken out a formula and they told Congress, get back to work and update your analytics, update your metrics, update the reasons why you think states need to be pre-clearing their voting changes to comport with traditional uh, voter discrimination as it relates today, as opposed to 1965 when the Voting Rights Act was originally passed. And so whose job is that going to be? That's gonna be the congressional delegation's job in Texas, that's gonna be Congress's job, the US Senate, could be your job for those of you that are looking for a political path and sometimes politics may not be your first option it may just come to you because as president power said sometimes the half the game about leadership is just showing up but let me help you analyze a couple of things and let me also take this opportunity to also welcome you to austin for those of you that are not here i'm a little san antonio centric so i'm just curious to know is there anyone from san antonio here by way of hands all right what just throw out a high school for me there you go. Brackenridge, okay. Warren. Edison. Island. Nice. Keystone. Keystone, great. Great, great, great. Well, I have an Edison football helmet in my office in San Antonio, and, and there was a wonderful teacher who, who, who recently retired who taught government at Highlands, who I thought was awesome. And she forced her students to do extra credit by participating in civic engagement, whether it be working on a campaign working at the, you know, the food bank or someplace to show that, that you, know, you have to help people who have it harder than you. So good, that's a good mix of San Antonio. I also wanna invite you to come to the Capitol. I know you're going there tomorrow, but for those of you that have a, a few spare moments and if, they're, you know, if it's appropriate and you don't avoid curfew or anything like that, there is history being made on the Senate floor as we speak. There is a woman who had the courage to say, today I'm gonna show up. Today I'm gonna punch in my time clock and I'm gonna talk for 13 hours because I think it's important that if we're gonna have a discussion about the rights of women and their health and their health choices, that we actually have a conversation, we don't have it dictated to us. So Wendy Davis had the courage to step up and she'll be on her feet for 13 hours today if she's gonna be successful. And so if you can't make it over there, send her a tweet, let her know that you have her back, whether you believe in the issue or not, 
I do believe we, we all agree that when we participate in our government, that's when we can get the most out of it. So if you have a chance to stop by, please stop by the East Wing of the Senate. But let's talk about some things. Let's put this in perspective. In 10 years, Texas grew by 4 million people. 89% of all of that growth was minority, African-American, Hispanic, Asian, 65% alone Hispanic, 1 million children brought to the state of Texas or born in Texas under the age of 18. Of the 1 million children, 95% of them Hispanic. This state is changing, it's changing rapidly, it's changing by the day. But where are we? Because people ask me all the time, I chair a Hispanic caucus, I am Hispanic, I've been 14 years, or going on 14 years in the Texas legislature, people always ask me, what is the biggest issue facing Latinos in Texas or Latinos in the country today? And I get asked that all the time. And so let's talk about a few things. Let's talk about our demography. There are 9.4 million Latinos in Texas. Over half of all Hispanics in Texas are over the age of 25, did not have a high school diploma, and that was a 2003 study. Hispanics are 51% of the total high school Texas public school population, and they make up 50.8% of Texas's 4.99 million students. And so is education the single most important issue impacting the Latino community when you look at this disparity, when you see the growing number of Hispanics in public school systems, yet you see record declines in funding and financing, and as uh, President Powers told you, it took everything we had to put $3.93 billion back into public education. Bear in mind, we took $5.4 billion out, or lawmakers chose to take $5.4 billion out. I wasn't part of that conversation. I was against it. But we could only manage to put $3.93 billion. And let me tell you what this does. When we do this, we send a message that it's okay to send 160,000 children to school and not give them a dime for a book, not give them a dime for a desk, not give them a dime for a ride on a bus. That's the message we send, but yet we send these kids, we send these students to Edison High School and Warren and other places, and we expect the local school districts to provide an education for them. I don't know with what money, but we expect them to. Uh, and so oftentimes people tell me, well, public education is probably the single most important issue impacting the Latino community. But then some people say it's health care. Let's talk about it. 38% of all Texas Latinos do not have health insurance. The highest, Texas is the uninsured capital of the United States. We are the highest percentage and the second highest only to California in the number of the uninsured. The single largest demographic that's not insured in Texas are women and children. 60% of Texas uninsured are Hispanic, 3.6 million. But yet we had an opportunity to tell the federal government we will put in a dollar for a Medicaid expansion in Texas, and if we put in a dollar, you give us back nine. This is a business deal, whether you're in equity, you don't pass up on those returns, whether you are a person of faith and you believe in helping those who can't help themselves, there's no question about that. If you're somebody who just cares about your backyard and know when you expand Medicaid and healthcare opportunities in Texas, it'll grow, it'll shrink unemployment by 1.8%, it'll provide thousands of jobs that are estimated to pay somewhere around $90,000 a year. And very few public policy choices bring the religious community, the business community, uh, and the political community together to say this is the right thing to do. But yet Texas has chosen to not expand its Medicaid coverage, has chosen to not provide insurance for all of Texans, but in particular the largest spikes of that uninsured population, Hispanics. So people tell me, well, maybe it's health care that's the single largest issue impacting Hispanics in Texas. Well, some will say, well, look, it doesn't matter the color of our skin. We all have the same problem, so why don't we look at things that are more race neutral? Let's look at water, let's look at roads. That's fair. Today, water is a $50 billion proposition to fund our 1997 water plan, and I can't take credit for it, I was sitting in President Powers' product liability class in 1997. But the 1997 water plan today costs $50 billion because it's continuously getting ignored and we never fund it. We wait another five years, it'll be even more than that. Lawmakers found the, they found it within them to allocate $2 billion. And so if you wanna know 
how $3.93 billion went back to schools, I'm going to tell you real easy. People like me and others said, for every dollar you put into water, I want to see a dollar in public education. Because if you need our votes, and in this instance they needed 100 votes, if you need to, if, to get 100 votes in support of $2 billion for water, I need to see some money for schools. And we started chipping away $500 million at a time until we arrived at $3.93 billion. So water is a $50 billion proposition. Transportation is a $488 billion proposition to fix and maintain roads by 2030. To meet our needs by 2030, we need $488 billion. Why is that difficult for those that you are asking? I'll tell you. Because I serve in a legislature with people who to actually take what I think is practically a blood oath to do a couple things. Shrink spending, reduce the size of government, and have no new spending. And so if you think about it, let's look at it from a business perspective. One of the most productive, productive and lucrative parts of our state is the Eagle Ford Shale area where all the oil and gas exploration is taking place. The oil and gas industry alone takes almost sole responsibility for putting almost about a billion dollars a year into our economic stabilization fund. And they told us they needed a billion dollars to repair roads in the area because you can imagine these massive commercial vehicles driving on county roads, what that does to wear and tear on a county road that was built for a passenger truck to now have multiple semi-trucks there every day, every hour of the day. So the oil and gas industry said, give us a billion dollars. We need to mail, build bigger roads, stronger roads, roads that last. And it sounds easy. They give us a billion dollars. Let's give them a billion. They create jobs. They're providing oil and gas. They're building our economy. But when you think about it, that billion dollars, new money, that billion dollars goes to TxDOT. So it expands government. It grows government. In other words, it's counterintuitive to the philosophy that overwhelmingly a majority of the House is already sworn to. So how do you provide for that progress? How do you even get to $488 billion in road transportation when you can't even get to the first billion? It's a significant challenge, especially for those of you who come from that part of the state and have to drive to and from and go through the oil patch in the Eagle Ford to get there. And so people say maybe it's this resource infrastructure, water and roads and electricity generation. In Texas, we're oil and gas rich Texas. We are dead last in the lower 48. We are number 48 in our reliable energy transmission system. In other words, we can produce all the energy, but we can't move it across the state to keep up with demand. And if you go look at our charts to show how much supply and how much demand we have, they touch. And in some instances, we actually have more demand and supply than we have these brownouts. What stops us from saying, let's take a billion dollars of that purported $12 billion that it was before we took some money out for water. Let's take a billion dollars, put it on the street, tell folks, meet us halfway. Let's do a couple of things. Let's provide new energy generation, but let's locate it along the Texas-Mexico border so that we can sell our energy to Mexico when we have too much, or we can close the valve and sell it directly to Texas when we need it the most. What's wrong with that? Or even better, let's do a new energy generation but at the same time, let's tie it to, uh, let's build it over a brackish aquifer. Brackish is salt, salty water aquifer. So let's sell energy during the day because that's profitable. And then let's make water at night. Let's desal water and then we sell water. So we sell energy by day, water by night. Why don't we do that? But again, these critical decisions require an expansion of government, requires us to think big. And here lately, we, we haven't been thinking very big. And so maybe it's, resource infrastructure. Maybe it's our voter participation. Let's analyze this. I don't want to be a partisan, but I'm a Democrat. I don't want you to pick sides. I, don't, I think that I take the view that when both political parties fight for Hispanics, Hispanics win. That's my view. Here, you know, having said that, I think that there's a difference between acts and words, uh, and sometimes your actions will speak louder than your words. But in voter participation, we have 2.1 million eligible Hispanics that are not registered to vote in the state of Texas. And on top of that, we have 1.3 million Hispanics who are registered but do not vote. 3.4 million Hispanics sitting on the sidelines. Races in Texas, statewide races in Texas, are being decided anywhere between 800,000 to a million two. So could you imagine if just a third of these Hispanics started voting 
what it does for competitive races in Texas and whether or not we'd have these assaults, whether they be women's rights, minority rights, whether we try to roll back the clock on college tuition, whether it's, you know, or, or public education financing or school, you know, healthcare financing. Imagine what that does, what a game changer that would be. So maybe it's voter participation. And so what I've come to realize is when you look at all these things, and you can go on, we can talk about housing, we can talk about access to capital, we can talk about you know, a number of quality of life issues. But bear in mind this, we will need a healthy and educated workforce if we're gonna sustain this increasing in demand uh, resource infrastructure challenge of water, energy, and roads. Because I will tell you, looking at these demographics, it'll be Hispanics, a, it'll be your brain power that's fixing the problem. B, it'll be your wallets that's paying the debt service on some very expensive projects. And there's not a lot of debt service that we can do when you're you know, working in a service sector as a waiter or waitress or a busboy if we're not providing meaningful educational pathways and striving for excellence. And this is one of the things that I get excited about. I actually drove up from San Antonio to come to this. And, and I know that we're being filmed, but my intentions were to play hooky today from the legislature because we had an all-nighter Sunday and Monday uh, and had a very big day a few days before that. And my wife is working and someone has to pick up our children at 5.30 and it's $6 a minute for every minute you're late. And I have two kids in the pre-K program. Uh, and so my intent was to stay behind. And when we went through the schedule last night, I said it's important to be here because it's actually you're going to be the agents of change in there. I, I think I'll have some supporting role, but it's actually your job to define what you think the single largest issue is that impacts Texas or more specifically impacts Latinos in Texas. I have now concluded that I think the single largest challenge that we face in Texas as Hispanics, as Latinos, is the fact that we are 38% of the population and we don't act like it. And I take the view that the minute we start acting like it, the minute we start going to the courtroom and demanding voting rights, the minute we start standing and locking down on the House floor and saying no, mo no money for water unless we have money for schools. The minute we, turn, we, we take a winning model like that and now say we want money for transportation just like you do, but we also think it's important to have a responsible discussion about health care. The minute we start doing those things, these problems have a tendency to not necessarily take care of themselves, but they certainly pick up momentum, they pick up some leverage. And so the minute we start acting like 38% of the population in business, in humanities, in social sciences, things start to change. And so I think my challenge to you is to get you to work very hard on these issues that you're addressing, because they are very important, but for you to start thinking big picture wise and just think what happens when our communities come together. And this is not just a Latino specific message to the exclusion of others. This is a message of when we all work together in this and we all recognize the richness in our diversity and that everybody has something to participate, then things become a little easier to solve because we're all in this together. At the end of the day, when you get on 35, doesn't matter what color you are when you're sitting in traffic, when you go to your faucet and you turn on your sink and nothing comes out, doesn't matter. You cannot buy a month's worth of water at Costco. You cannot go to Sam's and get a megawatt of electricity for the month. When it's out, it's out. We share in this together. But for Hispanics in particular, I think that disproportionately, this problem falls on our shoulders. And again, it's gonna be our brain power and our pocketbooks that are gonna fix it. And so it starts now. So unfortunately, mañana is not acceptable anymore. And so when you wake up in the morning and you decide you're gonna take on the world, I think it's just like President Power said. Half of it is just showing up. Half of it is just saying, today I choose to be relevant and I'm gonna make a difference. And I tell you, if enough people do that, things start changing very, very quickly. So I hope that you have a really inspiring you know, week, and I'm guessing the Subiendo Academy is how long? Five days. So you will have a productive week, and I hope you take some experiences back with you. I hope you take some friendships back with you, and I hope you use this as an opportunity to sort of evaluate where do you want to spend your next four years, because you're going to have some big decisions to make, and college is not an option. We're all going to college. But looking at environments that are conducive to your development, looking for places that support and enrich your lifestyle and your environment 
being in a place like Austin, I knew from day one, I went to a college in Abilene and played football. I was about this big in the sixth grade, and so I always thought football was my deal. But when I became very serious about school, I ended up graduating from San Antonio. I took an urban fellowship in New York, and then I came back and went to law school at the University of Texas. And applying to law school, I probably had options. But I knew that being in Austin, Texas was really going to sort of set the tone for me to decide what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to participate in Texas at some level, and the University of Texas is, the, is a conversation starter. You know, you walk in a room, people know you went to UT. Trust me, it starts lots of conversations. But find a place that's important to you. Find an environment where you're going to thrive and challenge yourself to do some great things. And for those of you that don't know this, Austin is a great place to do some great things. And I think that you'll have a, a very positive experience. And if I can help you in either way, any way, we have internships. We are, our caucus has a fellowship program uh, for, for aspiring students. We also collaborate when we can with the university in lots of ways. Let us know what I can do for you. Let us know what the Texas House of Representatives can do for you. And let me know how I can help you reach that next level. So with that, I want to thank you for allowing me to come talk with you for a few minutes today. Thank you. Eliana will join me on stage. Thank you. We have a small token of our appreciation from Subiendo, so. Thank you again, Representative Martinez Fencher. We appreciate you being with us. President Powers, thank you for your continued support of Subiendo. We are very fortunate to have you leading this great university, and thank you for all that you do. Thank you to Target and our Texas Exes who are sitting at our tables as our table host today. Thank you for being with us. Um, students, we will begin to depart for our tour of the Harry Ransom Center. This is one of the great treasures that we have on this campus, and um, we'll be moving to that next section of our schedule. Um, Please take all of your items with you. Sorry, this is a little bit of housekeeping for us. Be sure to take all your items with you. Um, team leaders, you may leave your materials in the back of the room. And we will be departing in 15 minutes. So guys, get ready. And thank you again for being with us.